Welcome to Theory of Pets. I'm a passionate pet owner with a drive to help others like me uncover the truth about the pet industry and what goes on behind the scenes. Hey everyone, welcome back to Theory of Pets. One of the questions that I am asked most often is, should you raise your pets and your children together? A lot of people worry specifically when it comes to dogs, if it's safe to raise them with children, if it's good for the kids, if it's good for the dogs. Um, And the same question can be asked about any pet. So Today, I actually had the opportunity to speak with Dr. Jody Dean, and she um, has a PhD. She's a therapist for children, and she wrote a book called Roxy the Doxy Finds Her Forever Home, and this book is actually, um, it's partly a true story about her dachshund roxy um and it also ties in some aspects of adoption and foster care um it's a great story to read with your kids to bring up a lot of different aspects of um, pet ownership in the book she talks about you know the responsibilities that you have caring for a dog and um roxy actually the real life roxy um competes in different competitions and has won a bunch of um you know, medals and ribbons. So it talks about that and the different things that you can do with your dogs um, in that aspect. So I had a great conversation with Dr. Dean and she talked a lot about the book, of course, but also about raising dogs and kids together and how they can really benefit from each other. It's it's beneficial for both sides, um, but there are also some things that you need to know as a parent, a pet parent and a parent of human children, um, the type of dogs that families have typically are uh, more mellow, more laid back dogs. Um, Dogs that like to do things like walking and hiking. Um, Usually you find dogs that are more driven, working dogs, those kind of dogs. You don't find those so much working out well with families. Um, Sometimes they do. It depends on the family. But uh, Dr. Dean talks about how to choose a dog that's right for your family as well um, in my interview with her. So I'm going to go ahead and let you guys listen to that and then I'll come back. So to start us off, um, I so first of all, I want to say thank you for coming on um, to Dr. Dean. She is here to talk to me today. And one of the things when we were talking um, before I started recording for the interview, one of the things we were talking about is that, um, you know, she's actually taken a little bit of flack for uh, the book. Some people are criticizing it and saying that she is – Uh, comparing dog adoption with child adoption and of course that's not at all what she means to do with this book Um, so she had asked me what I thought when I read the book is that what I got of course it wasn't so uh, I'm going to start you guys off with my response to that question it's I mean I'm not going to say you can compare it but there are certainly some aspects that you can take from Um, you know, adopting pets because we also, of course, we rescue pets. We have cats and dogs and a bunny and we always (laughs) seem to have rescue animals. Um, So, you know, our kids are familiar with rescuing animals to begin with. And of course, they're also familiar with having um, adopted siblings. So, um, you know, they sort of understood that going into it and reading this book. But um, it definitely, you know, it it, it's more about... um, Res- you know, I, I wouldn't say it's comparing the two at all. It's definitely about the dog rescue um, and just helping the kids, you know, sort of see the similarities and maybe really feel more comfortable with their situation if they're um, if they have some questions or they're not, um, you know, quite sure how they feel about uh you know, moving through the adoption or the foster care process, living with a different family. Um, You know, as well as I do, I'm sure that um, sometimes it's not even adoptive and foster kids anymore. It's um, kids living with grandparents or aunts and uncles, you know, different types of families. And I think, um, you know, that's what we took from Roxy the Doxy was whatever your family is, whether it's adopted, whether it's, you know, living with relatives or anything like that. Um, mm-hmm. It's it's mm-hmm. a process. It's it's scary yep. and it's exciting and it's, um, mm-hmm. you know, all those kind of different things that, that Roxy goes through. Um, you know, so I, I certainly wouldn't say it compares the two. I definitely did not get that. 
Cool. Okay, that's awesome. Wow, it sounds like you, your your house must just be hysterically fun, like at all times. We, my Love husband and I, rescue. God love him. He <laughs> deals with all of my craziness. Um, we call it organized <laughs> chaos. Is what our house is. It's it's just it's organized chaos, and there's no other way to explain it. Yep. There are kids and dogs and animals, and and it's always busy. It's a whirlwind, but it's wonderful, and we would not have it any other way. Yeah, that's awesome. That's, I love hearing that. Uh, yeah. I actually, I got started um, before. Now I, I am a freelance writer and I um, work with Top Dog Tips now, but I was a freelance writer for other places, for other sites and things for many years. Um, I started working from home when we, um, you know, when we had kids and we started doing the foster care thing and it's it's easier for me to be home all the time. But before I did that, I was actually a teacher. That's what my, my degree is in, is elementary education. So um, I've been working with kids and families for a really long time. And now um, we work with pets and families too. Yep, yep. That's a you know good transition. Because I think what, you know, teaching and working, I, I don't know how teachers can do it for 35 years. I, because that to me, teaching to me is actually one of the most difficult things ever. And I don't think teachers, I think teachers so, sometimes, I mean, for, at first, I think they're treated not well. But the other thing is, I, I don't think these teachers can ever get time to step back and realize how much they impacted a, a child or children. And I jokingly tell people, and I'm not that, it's not that funny because it's probably true, but if there hadn't been, you know, the certain teachers at certain times who'd said something to me nice and, and supportive, that instead of earning a PhD, I might have earned 20 to life. I mean, seriously. Absolutely. <laughs> And I just don't think, I don't think we recognize that um, at all in this country. It's different other places, but not not here, and it's sad. So I just, you know, these teachers here, I mean, it's usually just burn out after 10 years. It's crazy. So. Absolutely, and especially um, with the way that, you know, education in this country is um, with no child left behind and a lot of standardized testing and things, it's, uh, it's tough for sure for a lot of kids and... Yeah. You know, like I, I mentioned earlier, I mean, a lot of kids, it's not just school that's tough. Their home life is, it's not what it used to be. You know, it's not no. focused on the kids and um, helping to raise them and watch them grow and, and nurture them. It's so many other things are so busy and priorities are crazy now. And, um, uh -huh. you know, a lot of kids live in different types of families and they, they don't always necessarily live with mom and dad or even one or the other. It's very different yep. now. So um, it's yeah. a lot. You it's a challenge. Teachers can't solve for that. There's nothing you, they can do. Absolutely I mean, you have not. they have eight, they have six to eight hours. It, it, that's it. It's you know, a, a day, and it's just I don't know what's going to happen. I it it worries me as well. It's so it's such a challenge every day, and um, you know, knowing that the kids are not just school is not the only challenge. Home life is not the only challenge. It's every single day is a challenge for some kids, um, and you. When you started, is your PhD um, in counseling and therapy for children? Yeah. When I started, I wanted, I, I worked with um, primary adolescents, kids and adolescents, and, and really the, the more, the more, the harder the case, the better it was because, um, you know, I think it, I just really liked getting, a, you know, a family and, a, and usually a kid that was just so lost and having a really hard time and being able to take that entire system and work on it really hard until it shifted and, and things shift. Because it's never the kid. I mean, unless they've got something organic, brain, you know, brain and disease or something, that's just, just right. the kids, them. But other, otherwise, you know, so much of it within the family and how many times, you know, <laughs> Parents would come in and drop their kid off. Okay, we'll be back in forty. And I say, no, 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 sit down. And they like, well, no, you have to fix the kid. No, yeah, no, that's, that's not how we play. But yeah, so I did, and I did professional athletes as well. Mm -hmm. That's oh, wow. kind of the same. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot of similarities. That's <laughs> funny. <laughs> yeah. So then you adopted Roxy, your dachshund. Yeah. So Roxy, I have had dachshunds my entire life. I love the breed. I'm a big believer in. You know, it's kind of either sticking with a breed you really know and love or, um, you know, if you're going to get another breed, obviously learning a lot about it. But my, I, I actually have an old AKC registration dated 1952, before I was born, very much, before. Um, but my, so my parents had a dog, a dachshund, and they had a, a registered AKC dachshund, so I grew up with them. So wow. I've, I've had a number of dachshunds over the years. 
And um, there's a group in California, so in California, Docs and Relief, and this woman has placed probably 3,000 dogs. Wow. Dogs, and she's incredibly good. I mean, and she's one of these one of these rescues who, you know, they, they, they temperament assess, they work with the dog, and then when they place, um, if you cannot keep the dog or if you die or you have to find a contract, just like with a really good breeder, that the dog will come back to them, not not go to your neighbor, not go somewhere else. The dog will come back to them to be replaced. And so I got Roxy, it'll be four years ago in January, and not the first dachshund, but I, I could tell that there was something different about this one. And she was just a challenge and a handful, really smart, really athletic. Um, and I started taking uh, obedience classes with her in, I was living in California, so I've been there been there forever and I found this really good trainer and started taking obedience classes and um, it, it shifted everything basically she learned really quick I and mean, she was a mess I, I didn't know what I was doing and you know she was she shifted really quick and just became really good at it and um, that led me to doing other dog sports with her and she's multiple titles which is hysterical I mean she's not an AKC registered dog and she continues um to be to earn titles, and she's entering. And she's actually starting work on. Um, we're starting tracking practice, blood tracking, because there's a group out here. Actually, I think they're based in Jersey, and he trains um, blood tracking dachshunds, and they they track so like when hunters shoot a deer and it runs off, they don't want a wounded deer out there or a bear or whatever. Dachshund he comes, you know, call the dachshund. Dachshund goes out and tracks them, and they're best, basically the best tracking dogs, if, if, believe it or not, and they just work. So she's going to start working on that. So she's definitely, and it inspired me to write the book. It was sort of one of those moments in time where you go, you know, I was kind of retired. It was at that point where I, I didn't have to really work, and I wanted to still, you know, do something. And I've always had that soft spot for kids who are just lost. I mean, they, they don't know what to say. They don't know how to talk about their feelings. And they're not little adults, you know, who can talk about their feelings, you know, around a, a, a cocktail table, and um, it just literally came to me in the weekend, and I put it together, and the process took about a year, and there it is, and this is a wow. process. Yeah. So when you work with kids and families, do you ever recommend um, canine therapy or even just adopting a dog for a, a kid that maybe you think would benefit from a family pet? Yeah, you know, it, there will be situations where, I mean, first off, you know, when, when there are kids who are, like, developmentally um, disabled and also kids on the autism spectrum, they're using um, canine and equine therapy, you know, interaction and engagement with, with animals um, to increase sort of that social awareness, if you will, um, and it's working brilliantly, not a surprise to a lot of people who kind of been in that field, yeah, and um, you know, bringing and and then kids who, um, especially autistic kids, they're putting service dogs in the home for kids who self injure. You know, the ones that that, uh-huh. that hit themselves or hit their heads on, the, and the dog will. Um, it's usually a, a big dog like a golden retriever or a lab, and a very calm, um, structured dog. And the dog will actually physically get between, you know, either the child's hand hitting themselves in the face or the child hitting um, their head on the wall, so that they get in, get in there. And it calms the child. And the dog essentially kind of wraps themselves around the dog. If you watch it, it's fascinating. And, um, of course, with the autistic kids, that, that feeling of something wrapping around you or that force of um, being kind of held, that helps. Um, but it's seeming, when you see it done with a canine versus a person, it, the difference is very significant. They react differently, and it's, it's amazing to watch. And the dogs can calm them really quickly. I think we're just starting to understand this and how, how we can use them. And then, you know, a lot of people would... Um, you know, in therapy, they would they would say, you know, you know, should we get a dog? Should we bring a dog into the family? Is this a good time? And it really depends a lot on the dynamic of the family, kind of where they are, kind of how, their emotional health status at that point. And you don't want to bring a dog into a family that has a ton of chaos, and of course, you don't bring a dog into a family that's got some violence, and they sometimes have that part of it too. But if the time was right, uh, it would it would be a nice addition. Uh, also for kids who have issues, you know, social anxiety, problem making friends, anxiety at school, 
bringing a dog in or a, you know, a pet that would, be, that would fit the household. It's helpful. It would be something for them to, um, to bond with, get to know. Um, of course, you know, kid has a dog. Sometimes they can make friends better. They can make friends with other people who have dogs. Right. So there are definitely right. times that, that that was a good therapeutic intervention. When people ask you about dogs, do you make recommendations um, for certain breeds or for rescuing versus just going to a breeder and looking for a certain dog? Um, you know, with regard to what kind of breed, I, if people say, what kind of breed should I get? There are, there's a couple books out that are really good. And I also, you know, ask people, you know, did you grow up with a certain breed? Um, what breed do you think you want? You know, what do you want this dog for? I mean, you want a dog that's going to chill out with you on the couch every day? Um, do you want a dog that's going to be a working dog? You know, do you want a dog to run with? Um, do you want to, you know, maybe do some dog sports? Do you want to try agility? You know, some people are like, I need to get in shape, and my, I want a dog that will get in shape with me. So taking all those pieces and then really looking at what kind of temperament, I encourage people to go to... Um, Meet the breeds. A lot of cities have these. They use sometimes once, twice a year, and you can actually go, and people can see the dogs, and they can ask the um, breeders or the rescues about the temperament and if that's the right dog for them. So people get a lot of information that way. And then when people ask me about rescue versus breeders, really I explain to them um, a reputable breeder, um, you know, health certificates, you know, they're not running a puppy mill. They don't got. They don't have like sixty crates of dogs sitting in their right. backyard. Um, the con. They, you know, they want a contract that the dog will come back to them if something happens. They have a health certificate. They also will interview the person coming to get the dog, and it's it's a, you know it's almost like a Department of Defense <laughs> security check <laughs> interview. I mean, you will get you will get checked out. And, and interestingly enough, most reputable bre- uh, I'm sorry, rescues will do the same thing. Absolutely. You, they absolutely will put you through the mill. A lot, of them, a lot of them do home visits. A lot of them do more than one home visit. Um, and I know the rescue that um, where I got Ro- Roxy, they, hit, they turn people down. Um, if they, don't, they don't let everybody rescue. So I think that if people understand, um, you know, really there's reputable rescues. There's really good reputable breeders. And then there's sort of all that gray area where, um, you know, people, a lot of people land because getting a, a pet is emotional. And they, they go and they see somebody who has some puppies and, oh, that puppy's so cute and I'm going to take that puppy and I got a puppy. Now they just realize, I don't even really know, if, you know, what breed it is or if it's, you know, is this a, a, you know, the mutt or what, what the heck did I get and what do I have to expect? And, it, you know, they, then they kind of have to, back up and, and try to figure out what happened and they you know they may need to return it and they, they can't a breeder or the rescue won't take it back. So I think once people really understand the difference between the um, the good and bad, I, I think people make a pretty prudent decision. I think really educating people is super, super good. Absolutely. And that I mean not just for families with kids, it's especially important for families with kids, but really anybody that's looking to adopt a dog the same can be said you want to find a, a breed that's gonna match your lifestyle and you know your environment your home um and not just go out and adopt the first cute face that you see right the other thing that people i'm afraid get into um is they sort of get into the dog of the day you know what is the cool dog to have right now yeah um you know like every like like there's you know a lot of young men um you want a malinois (laughs) because they've seen that they're very aggressive working dogs they're very high energy brilliant dogs but boy, you better have a lot of experience and you better have a plan. Um, it's not just a dog to walk around and look cool with. And, um, you know, if somebody wants a dog, well, I want a dog I can put in my purse. Well, <laughs> you know, that dog's got two more legs than you do. That dog wants to walk. Leave me. Not, yeah. not go in your purse. It's not Absolutely. an accessory. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of people have to kind of get past that. You know, what is your, what is your goal here with a canine and before they make a, a good selection? Absolutely. So for um, 
kids, we talked a little bit about your book in the beginning. So it's Roxy the Doxy Finds Her Forever Home. And um, what I will do is, uh, because the podcast is on our website, um, theoryofpets.com, we also run it on YouTube and social media, and we put it on topdogtips.com as well. So it's all over the place. Um, but everywhere that we put it, we'll have a link to your site. Um, and if anybody wants to check out the books, and I know there are other Roxy books as well. Um, so if anybody wants to check those out. But it's basically the true story of your little dachshund Roxy um, and how she was adopted and uh, it kind of walks through you know her all of her emotions from being nervous about being adopted um, and then excited and um, meeting she has a new um, new family members you know a new sister and a new mom when she gets to uh, her new house so it, it touches on all of those different aspects of uh, adoption or foster care um, moving to a new home and being with a new family. Um, so parents or foster families, adoptive families could use it um, as a tool when they bring a new family member into their home. Absolutely. Um, and the, the other piece is too is um, Mina, who is the other little dachshund in the house, who ends up being Roxy's sister, is sort of representative of a child that is already in the home. Could be a bio child, could be another adopted child, but she's there first, you know how kids are. And so Mina has to kind of go through some machinations about, am I going to share everything with Roxy? Do I have to share everything? And, and as you know, when a new you know, child is coming in, even if it's a new baby, whatever, the kids at home are saying, well, wait a minute, do I have to share all the love? Do I have to share all my toys? Do I have to share my hairbrush? <laughs> wait a minute here. So that's an opportunity for parents to work with the child who's already in the home and say, well, what do you think Mina's thinking and what do you think you might do in that situation? Um, so every character represents a, 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 a actual potential character in a real life in a situation like that. And I, um, as I mentioned, you know, our, our family is a, a blended family of people and animals that are kind of always um, somebody new is always ending up in our home. Um, so my <laughs> our family is very... Um, used to that I guess and and they kind of know the drill with that so the part that stuck out to our kids uh, funny enough was um, in the back you have the section of meet the real Roxy the Doxy and you've got lots of pictures of Roxy in there um, and uh -huh. just kind of you know her basic information about her birthday and when she was adopted and things like that um, and a little bit about um, you know like her color is dapple so it's some little um, you know, informative pieces about dachshunds in there too, in case any kids are interested in um, that breed specifically. But you also go on to talk about uh, how Roxy's won um, different competitions and there's pictures of her ribbons in there. Um, it talks about what she likes to eat and you don't say dog food, you say that she likes salmon and she likes chicken and vegetables. Um, so that's what stuck out to my kids was um, our dogs don't compete. Our dogs are lazy house dogs. Uh, so, excuse me. So they were asking about um, dog competitions. What do dogs compete in? What does how does Roxy win those um, ribbons that you show in the book? And um, talking about what dogs eat. Um, you know, they were asking about the different foods. Can dogs eat this? Can dogs eat that? Would she like this? Would she like that? So it it kind of opens that um, communication too if you're going to be bringing a new dog into your family. Um, I think it gives you that opportunity of talking about um, maybe some activities you might do with the dog, the way that you're going to feed the dog, um, different responsibilities that everybody might have if somebody's responsible for feeding or walking or, um, you know, cleaning up messes or whatever the case may be. Um, I think it opens that up as well, which is a nice um, piece, especially when you're bringing a new pet into the family. If they might have, if they're a rescue, maybe they're a little timid, they need a little time to warm up. Um, it's good to talk about those things before you bring another pet into your home. And I think that's a brilliant point, Samantha, because, um, you know, what that does with kids is it makes them part of a, a really important process. And as you know, when kids are part of that, they take ownership and they can get excited and they all get a piece of it and they all have a little job. You know, they've got to go research. Okay, what should we feed? What color should, uh, should the leash be? Uh, where should we go on our walks and things like that? And when kids have part of that, that's how kids bond more with the family, bond more with the pet. Um, you know, 
developed that um, interest in doing something new and different, which is always great for kids, you know, to have them take a step that they've not taken before. So it's a, it's a really brilliant point. Absolutely. And I know um, one of the things that we do and now, of course, we've had um, multiple rescue dogs and we've we've rehomed uh, certain strays that have come and um, we keep a lot of them. Most of them end up staying with us. But um, so, you know, there's always different animals in our house from, like I said, from rabbits to cats to dogs. Um, so we always take that time to remind everybody in our house that every dog's different every cat's different every rabbit's different and even if you adopt a puppy uh, most puppies are pretty easy going and they're going to want to play and run around and they like all of the fawning and all of the attention that kids give to new animals but not every puppy's like that certainly not every rescue dog is like that Um, so we took that opportunity when they were asking questions about that to um, revisit that and you know talk about how uh, when we bring new pets into our home they get their own space whether it's a crate or a dog bed or whatever it might be that's their little spot and we don't bother them when they're there that's where they go and they need a break Um, and we talk about things like not getting in their face Um, you know if they want to play if they come to you and they want to play that's great Um, don't you know suffocate them all the time when when you want to play Um, because it is exciting for kids when you bring in a new animal and they want you know, that excitement kind of peters out over time. But those first weeks or two, it is really exciting. And they want to be around the dog every minute all the time. And they want to play and they want to sleep with it. And they want to touch it all the time. And some dogs just don't like that. Yeah. And what's great about that, Samantha, is you're teaching them an incredibly critical real-world lesson. Because when you go out in the world, not every person wants to be, you know, your friend all the time. Not everybody Absolutely. wants you to come up and talk to them first. Maybe they're shy. They want to come over and talk to you. And so teaching them to recognize the different um, body language, you know, kind of the eye, you know, what the eyes are doing, what the face is doing, to, to be able to pick up and have really, it really develop that emotional intelligence about social situations, it's a really good way to do it. Absolutely. And I mean, you know, like I said, that's when I looked through Roxy the Doxy being a foster parent and being a dog owner and being a parent of a biological child, you know, a lot of things kind of stuck out to us. And um, so I think the book is beneficial in many ways, um, depending on your family situation. I think um, it's very useful. And um, I know on your site, there's um, other books as well. And um, if anybody is interested, like I said, I'm going to link to that so people can check out that. But um, I I don't, I'm not sure if it's out yet, but uh, in the back of the uh, this book, it says that you have one uh, coming out called Roxy the Doxy, New Dog in School. Um, So there's some other ones that uh, you know, if you have a kid that's struggling in certain areas, um, not just the Roxy the Doxy books. There's a ton of books out there that are great resources for parents that are struggling, that don't have the answer or don't know how to start the conversation. Uh, that can be sometimes the hardest part. You know what to say, but you don't know how to approach it um, and, you know, and start that conversation. So um, yeah. books are such and a that's huge... Exactly, that's exactly why I put the, the parent guide and the clinical guide in back. Because parents always ask me, and you're, 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 you probably have parents ask you, you know, okay, what's the right thing to say? <laughs> What should I say exactly? All How do the I start the conversation? You know, what's the what are the pitfalls to avoid? So I did the, the clinical guide and the parent guide, and just just as jumping off points. It's not you know a hundred percent right or wrong. It's really just sort of a, uh, some talking points to get things started and to get the conversation on the table. I've actually had teachers tell me that they're using the parent guide in classrooms um, if they've had you know a child who was adopted come in mid-year, you know, this is Becky, she's, you know, adopted, she may be an international adoption, making it kind of obvious, you know, that it's an adoption. And so a lot of kids are like, well, what is that about? And they're using the book to read through it so that it's not threatening to the child who's been adopted. They don't feel like, okay, everybody's staring at me. And then people can ask questions about Roxy and about that process. Um, But the kids can learn about what adopted means. Because some kids don't know. They come from the sort of traditional family and haven't, haven't encountered that yet, especially young kids. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think that's important to point out. And one of the things that I forgot was it does have um, the therapist guide and then the parents guide in the back. Um, and, you know, if you do have questions, there's some great pointers in there. But I think one of the things that I've learned from having so many kids and working with so many different children and families, every kid is different and they see things differently. So when yep. parents always ask me, what should I say? What can I say? How do I start? It's it's going to be different depending on your children, you, your family situation, um, you know, what you, what your lifestyle is and, and what yep. you encounter day to day. So um, I think reading a book like Roxy or some of the other books that are out there, it just, it helps get the wheels turning for your child and they're going to start thinking about it. And you're, you will probably be surprised that your kids are going to ask questions like I said uh, the one thing that I never expected our kids to pick up on was um you know why don't our dogs play any sports why don't our dogs get any awards <laughs> you know and I I never in a million years would have thought that that's the one thing in that book that they would have picked up on but you know it's you just never know so um having you know a book something they can really easily relate to and then uh -huh. just hear what they have to say because they're going to ask a question that's probably going to make you think, oh my gosh, I never would have thought that you would have picked up on that. And that's a good, that's great. And you know, you may have some future junior handlers in your house that, that are going to bud from this, but it was funny. I got an email from a guy, he's a single dad and he's got a, his bio daughter and he bought her the book and she loved Roxy, loved Roxy. She emailed Roxy. She thought Roxy's so fun. And then she told her dad, I want to, I think we should adopt another baby. Oh boy. And he said, he had never thought about it, and she's, I think his daughter was eight, and she was at the age where she got what adoption was and what could it, it could mean, and, you know, he talked about what it could mean to the family and the changes. I mean, he's a single dad. You know, now it's going to be him with two versus one, and she was wanting to adopt somebody, you know, not a baby, somebody that was a little bit older. She thought would be a great idea. I don't know where this little girl came from, but she's very thoughtful, obviously. Absolutely. And he said, he said he's actually starting the process. Wow. To do a foreign adoption. Well, I will have you know that we have done uh, some research in our house in the last week or so uh, about agility, dog agility, because we have <laughs> a, um, a Labrador and then we have a little Beagle mix. And our Labrador is extremely intelligent. She's very easy to train. Um, we uh -huh. do. She's not a hunting dog. We don't. We haven't trained her to do that. But um, she and she loves our kids and she's very responsive to kids, which uh, are our beagle is not. She does what she wants and she will listen to me and my husband, but she does not listen to the kids very well. So um, they have decided that Sadie is our Labrador and that um, Sadie needs to earn ribbons like um, Roxy oh has earned ribbons. So what can they do? And, um, you know, we we told that me, I, I work, daddy works. We don't have a whole lot of time, but if you guys want to work with uh, Sadie, you know, let's do some research and find out about it. So um, they, they did take a lesson from Roxy, even though we're a family that um, has talked a lot about adoption and um, we <laughs> rescue animals. So there wasn't really a lot of questions there. They still found something uh, that they <laughs> took away from it. So um, it's, so that's, it's been an exciting thing in our house. I don't know if it'll stick around, but it's been around for a week or so now and they're very interested in it. Oh, that's hysterical. I don't know. Are you going to come after me? Maybe you may, you may just, <laughs> hey, you, you know, know it's, our it's, lab is actually, she's only two years old, so she's got plenty of energy. Um, she loves to fetch and play and uh, run around with the kids. So, you know, agility would be great for her. And if they want to yeah. work, um, so our kids range in age from 13 to six. So they're, they're all, you know, we don't have any little guys. Um, and so, you know, they're absolutely capable of, of yep. learning and working with her. And if they want to do it by all means, you know, it's, it's going to be good for everybody involved and, if they don't stick with it, they don't stick with it, but that's all right, too. You never know. Yeah. Agility's really fun. Um, even with kids, just some basic obedience classes with a good trainer are super fun. You know, it's outside and get them to um, learn, you know, just treat, reward, and how to kind of communicate with the dog. Barn hunt. Labs love barn hunt. Um, and that's pretty easy to find. That's a huge sport. It's really growing. Super fun. Um a lot of junior handlers doing that. Uh, it's great. There's yeah, so that that's kind of exciting. You guys. It, it is interested. exciting, and it you know, I mean, like I said, it's it's not just it's great for the kids certainly, but I think it's going to be great for our lab too. She's busy and active, and and has a lot of energy, so um, she enjoys every 
ounce of attention that she gets. So she's having a good week. Um, and I, I actually are, it's one of our, our middle ones. Um, she really seems to be interested um, in it. And, and so who knows where she'll take it. I mean, it might not be something that's just a hobby for a few weeks. It might be something that she takes wow. to a career in dog training. Who knows? That's amazing. I, yeah. I want. I hope you follow up with me and let me know what ended up happening. I think everybody's going to want to know. I, yeah, what we're I know. It's, <laughs> it's funny. Like I said, I mean, and I, I think all parents can can take that and, and learn from it, but you just never know what your kids are going to pick out of um, any, you know, stories or books that you read. It, it's maybe isn't going to be what you expect them to take from it. It might be something totally you know, out of the blue, but it, it's going to huh. work out, I think, well for us. So that's amazing. Yeah. It's I funny. Love... It's funny. Like I said, it's just, it's the last thing that we ever thought they would pick up from it, but they want her to win ribbons like Roxy. So <laughs> that's fine. Well, they keep me on your toes, right? Yeah. Right. When you thought you had them figured out, Constantly. bam, here comes something. <laughs> we have one that's out extremely of predictable and we can almost <laughs> guarantee what he's going to do. And then the other two, is just it's different every single day it depends on how they wake up and the mood that they're in that day and it's always a new exciting challenge <laughs> and actually we can say the same thing for um our our rescue animals you know sometimes you can almost bet on what they're going to do and other times they throw you for a loop so it's organized chaos that's what we we refer oh, to yeah. As. oh yeah oh i hear you and i hear you mm-hmm <laughs> Wonderful. Well, that was all the questions that I had. But if there's anything else that, um, you know, that you want to mention that we haven't talked about, you know, feel free to do that. I know um, I said we'd wrap up around 1130. So I don't want to keep you too long. Okay. No, I just, I was just, I appreciate it. I appreciate you talking about the book. I do want to throw out that the book has won numerous awards, much to our surprise, um, me and Roxy's surprise, I guess, <laughs> and including, it, it won the, the Creative Child Magazine Book of the Year for 2017. So it was really a humbling experience to be recognized that way. Um, you know, again, you, when you when you pick up that end of that leash, you really never know where you're going to go. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm sure, like you said, you you never had the idea to write a book until all of a sudden it sort of came to you yep. one weekend, and now here you are. Yep, exactly. And writing so, more, right? You you have more ideas for more Roxy books. Yeah, it's gonna Roxy's gonna continue, and she and all of the books will be um, like the one that's coming out early next year with Roxy going to school. That one will deal with. Um, you know, school fears, uh, test-taking anxiety, children going to school, worrying about how do I make friends, um, you know, what, what if somebody's mean to me, bullies, things like that. And Roxy's going to go through all those things. And then um, Roxy and then book after is going to um, meet a, another, a little friend, a little canine friend who's got a physical challenge. And there's going to be um, a lot of work to help that little dog figure out what is that little dog the best at. And um, they're going to find out, and it's going to be a nice, nice story. And there'll be a couple more after that. That's so great. We, you know, all, a lot, I think, um, therapy dogs are becoming more um, of a mainstream thing for physical and emotional struggles um, for adults and children. I think we're seeing a lot more of the benefits of uh, specifically dogs, but certainly animal therapy in general. Um, and this yeah. is just another, it sort of takes it to another level. You're still using animals um, in that therapy light but it's a different way of going about it so um, I commend you for that I think it's fantastic and um, we look forward to reading more Roxy books in our house oh, thank you so much Samantha as you can see, I had so much fun talking to Dr. Jody Dean. She was a great guest to have on the show. Um, I obviously, you know, I loved the book Roxy the Doxy. Our kids do as well. So if you're interested in um, the book or in learning more about Dr. Dean or kids and um, dogs, you can jump onto our website. If you're watching this on YouTube or social media, there's a link right under um, this podcast and you can jump onto our website and I've linked there. Um, um, uh, obviously a link to get the book if you're interested in that to learn more about it and um, also to the Roxy the Doxy Facebook page so if you have any questions or want to check that out um, that's on there and I've also linked some studies that uh, show some of the advantages of raising pets with kids some of the health benefits and emotional benefits um, the most recent study I share shows how dogs are linked to reduce stress in kids so um, 
if you're thinking about a therapy dog for your child or um, you just think that maybe, you know, your kids are going through a tough time, a tough transition, there are tons of testimonials and research out there from people who have been in those shoes, parents who have gotten dogs for their children and um, children who have now grown up to be adults that say that, uh, you know, during certain struggles in their life, maybe a parent's divorce or a move across the country away from friends and family, um, that dogs have really helped them. So do some research, check it out. Um, Dogs can be very, very beneficial to kids. Obviously, um, in our organized chaotic house, we raise dogs and kids and cats and kids and bunnies and we always have rescue animals uh, around our kids and it's been nothing but a blessing to our family. It's been such a wonderful experience for my husband and I, for our children and of course for the animals themselves. So if you guys have any questions on rescuing animals, on raising kids and animals, uh, send them my way. You can jump onto our website theoryofpets.com. You can leave your questions there. Uh, You can record them and I might use them on a future podcast or you can just send them through an email if you just want to ask a question privately. Um, You can do that as well and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. It usually uh, takes me a day or two but I will be sure to answer those questions for you. If you have any questions for Dr. Jody Dean, if you have something specific you'd like to ask her, um, you can send those questions to me as well and I'll forward those to her and make sure they get asked uh, on your behalf and get an answer for you. Um, And while you're on our site, if you could take just a minute, there's a link there for iTunes. If you can click on that and just give us a review. The more reviews that I get on iTunes, it's easier for me when I approach experts um, and potential people to be on as guests on the podcast. Um, If I can show them that people are listening and they like what they hear, uh, obviously they're a lot more apt to uh, come on to the show. So that really helps me out. If you could just take the second to review um, the show for me on iTunes, that would be great. Um, Of course, you know, send those questions along and I will be back with another episode in just a few short days. So thanks for listening, guys. I look forward to bringing you some more information about pets and the pet industry.